consuming gherkin, uh, one bite at a time. Uh, this is uh, this is our talk. So this is yeah, oh, there you go. okay. All right. Uh, a bit about gherkin. Uh, gherkin, as many of you know or don't know, um, is the language that you use to write acceptance tests with Cucumber, and it is also a parser. Um, about a year ago, uh, Athlete Pelosoy, who's the creator and maintainer of Cucumber, sent out an email on the mailing list, and I'm not sure if you can guys read, if you guys can read that, but uh, it says, uh, we need a faster parser. I'm currently looking at Regal, a super fast state machine compiler. It's used by Mongrel, Thin, Red Cloth, and H4K, to name a few, so it has a good track record in the Ruby community. Previous experience with Regal is not a must, but it's definitely a plus. Well, there's some Regal right there. Uh, Greg and I uh, accepted that offer, and uh, this is kind of what we've gotten ourselves into, uh, not really knowing exactly what to do. But uh, Accepted that offer having basically no prior experience with Regal. So. Yeah, so uh, uh, prior experience is definitely a, a, a plus, but not necessary. Um, now, in part of this talk is the, the aim of it is to show that this isn't really a, that's not necessarily a problem. Um, that if you dive into something and you're patient and you just follow the, the BDD or PDD cycle, you can get good maintainable code um, and, you know, just figure something out as you go. Um, so, okay, so Regal. Um, and I, I assume this is what you're here to, to hear about, hopefully. Uh, Regal is a tool for building parsers by specifying state machines with regular expressions. Now, there's a very common quote about regular expressions uh, in, in the computer industry. Um, some people in front of the problem think, I know, I'll use regular expressions, right? Okay. Now they have two problems. Um, and this is sort of the, yeah, sorry, um, maybe too soon. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is sort of the problem with regular expressions. I think that uh, Michael Jackson gave a talk about Citrus recently, and he put up this huge regex on the screen and says, what does this do? And I mean, the, the proper answer is like, well, no one really knows. Um, so there, so the, there are these two problems with regular expressions, um, two of them. Syntax, okay, and, and syntax. Now, they're a syntax, they're a, a, you know, they're a horrible, they're a great syntax, but they're syntax for specifying something. This is some, so here we have some perfectly normal syntax. Maybe some of you probably, have, or all of you, have used some of this before. We've got, you know, these are the, uh, uh, we've got like uh, uh, anchors for the beginning and end of a line, the beginning and end of a, uh, what is that, multi-line? The, these behave differently. Slash A slash Z is what marks the beginning and end of a, a line, the caret and the dollar sign mark the beginning and end of a line, including new lines. Um, so we've got some nice ambiguity there. And you have character classes. Uh, here we have the alternation operator, which is also conveniently, uh, uh, the syntax for alternation is the same as the syntax for uh, capture groups. Um, there we have, uh, right there, that, that F with the uh, question mark equals, this is called a, a zero width, wait, zero width positive, I can't remember what it's called, I just messed up. <laughs> um, uh, that's a, a zero width positive look ahead assertion. And these are kind of the bread and butter of regular expressions. Um, this is the kind of stuff that people really, they, they really love. Um, so but here's, here's a, an observation about it. And this is sort of to uh, uh, teach you think about regular expressions in a different way that might explain some of the problems that you have with them. Which is that it's, writing a regular expression that doesn't do what you want is more common than writing one that causes a syntax error despite the fact that it failed because of its syntax. Um, that is kind of a remarkable thing in, in computer science, I think, is that you have this syntax which is so powerful and which is so ubiquitous, but it works or it doesn't work. Uh, it, it, it works, it compiles, except it rarely does what you want it to do. Or there's oftentimes there's cases where uh, it does what you want it to do and you're unsure why it did that. Um, so the, the, the regular expression failures are usually semantic, meaning that the compiler never really tells you, oh no, that that's not valid, it's not valid. Instead, you're thinking, it's saying to you, like, no, I, I don't think that, that that regex means what you think it means. Um, so you're actually dealing with a failure in, in understanding what's going on with the regular expression. And what that means is that, you know, that doesn't mean the syntax is not the problem. Um, it is. Uh, but that, and that's because the syntax of for, for regular expressions, the syntax, produces things of such complexity 
um, that the character for character, if it's unmatched by other things in the, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, if there were a way to visualize what we're making, um, so you can reason about it better, that would be a big, big improvement. Uh, and Regal actually conveniently provides a way to do that. Um, so, and, and this is my next point, is that I, I think that a lot of failures with regular expressions uh, flow from the fact that we're talking about a, a piece of syntax, um, but we're saying, like, what does it mean to match? You know, what is doing the matching? We have, you know, statements you may have made, you may have heard, you may have made yourself, right? And when you're talking about regular expressions, you say things like, I match this string against the regex. <coughs> this regex is matching more than it should. Or you try to match regular or HTML with regular expression and you some Cthulhu, and that's a big, big problem. But just in yet, maybe someone has read the, the, the post on Stack Overflow. Uh, HTML is not a thing that can be parsed by regular expressions. Now, one of the amazing things about uh, um, Regal is that it, it's pragmatic enough. It provides the tools where you can actually build an HTML parser with regular languages, and it gives you the ability to jump out of that those those constructs when need be to handle things like uh, uh, recursive structures. Um, but this is this is this is one of the problems that regular expressions do not do the matching. When you are running a string into a regex and you're saying, okay, this regex matches X or Y or, or Z, um, that regular expression is not matching. Uh, what's what's actually happening? is that uh, it's compiling something behind the scenes is doing the matching. You wouldn't, for example, say, you know, oh my god, you guys, my class definition retrieved a record from the database. That doesn't happen, because a class is a syntactic, it, it, this, uh, the, the, the syntax for a, a class is this is a syntactic structure which the Ruby interpreter or which any compiler or whatever takes and converts into basically, you know, a, a machine code or, or operations. Um, you don't, we don't speak at that level yet. With regular expressions, we do. We talk about this piece of syntax as if they are what is happening, like the, the thing that is doing the work. But that is a, that's a red herring. Um, instead, what regular expressions really do, or what they are, is they're, they're a syntax for specifying state machines. And I, I'm sure that for some people, uh, uh, possibly with the background in compilers, this is obvious. Uh, but for most, but for actually not, not most, but for, for many programmers, especially with day-to-day -day stuff, maybe web developers, when you're using a regular expression, you rarely think, oh, I'm going to use this syntax, which is really convenient and concise, and I'm going to generate a finite state machine, which I'm then going to use to identify patterns in text. You don't think like that. You just think that this regular expression embedded in your code is that it matches somehow, and you know sometimes it doesn't match. Sometimes you know you, you curse or whatever, you break it up, uh, but sometimes it does, and then, and then you're all good. Um, so they're state machines, right? Well, many of us now many of us have had experience with state machines. They're pretty simple. Has anyone here used a, a state machine with Rails, for example, like Axis state machine or state machine? There's alter ego. Yeah, tons of people have. And are, are they generally pretty simple? Like they're they're clear. Uh, well, one of the reasons that regular expressions are so difficult to think of as state machines is that you don't generate the states yourself. When you're looking at a regular expression, the characters in the regex are the transitions. The characters of input are the events that are being sent to that machine, and the states are determined by the compiler. And I know this is uh, I'm glossing over a lot of uh, detail, but this is generally how it works. So Regal clarifies what you're doing when you're working with regular expressions to make them manageable. It gives you all sorts of tools to work with them and to combine them in different ways. Uh, and using that, you can make programs of, sort of, like, of complexity and of speed that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Uh, it's just a really pragmatic tool to have in your toolbox. Um, so before we get into Regal proper, which Greg's going to go through some of the syntax of that, I want to give you just an example to see what you can do with this. So let's look at a regular expression that matches the string ABC. Okay, how does that break down? A, B, and C are named transitions, and that is what the state machine looks like. You can see that they're, they're the, uh, when you compile that, you get four states out, basically one, two, three, and four, and there are, then there are transitions between those states, one transition for every character in the regex. And as, as, as characters are sent into that machine, um, if they match that transition, then it goes from state one to two, two to three, three to four. And once it gets to four, then it's done. 
And that is basically, in a nutshell, what Fraggle does for you. Um, it allows you to build very complex machines. This is a really simple one, but we're going to get into examples of, uh, of uh, big ones in just a second. All right, so how many of you have used Fraggle? Okay, got a couple. Um, did you enjoy it? Is it? Yeah, thumbs up. Great. Um, I love Rego. It's, it's really, really fun. Uh, let's look at some Rego. So here's uh, here's some Rego that compiles down to a Ruby class. Um, this is kind of the shortest example I could come up with that contains all of the kind of or the majority of the syntactic elements that you need to know about. Uh, the first line up there, machine M. We're just naming a state machine. Like we're naming a machine that's going to match something. Um, it's useful to give a name because you can include machines and other machines and kind of break things down into smaller pieces. Uh, M is a very interesting name, but uh, it's also not a very interesting machine. The second line is a named action, uh, which is kind of like a function uh, that really knows how to call. Um, what that function does is in that block there is just Ruby code. Uh, if you were targeting C or Java, you would have Java code in there. We're looking at Ruby right now. Next, we have a submachine, or another, basically, this is a state machine. Um, saying, here's a character class uh, looking for a vowel. Um, and we also tag an action at the end of that, so that when we have a match um, or have an event, uh, <laughs> we'll call that action. Next part of the uh, machine is the main definition, which is what's going to get executed when you run it. Um, here we're just saying vowels or anything else, and we want one or more. And then you got a couple of kind of weird things that you end up sticking into Ruby code. Um, percent percent write data. What this does is when Regal compiles this down, um, this is where the state machine gets inserted. Um, I'm not going to show you the Ruby code. It's totally okay. The, uh, the those percent percents they're like macros. Like if you ever use C, that's basically a defined statement. Um, when you process that with the Rego, you think of it as a preprocessor, it spits out a bunch of stuff where that is in the Rego file. Uh, data is, uh, for Ruby, you have to define data um, as an array of uh, bytes that you're going to be processing. Um, write init basically initializes the state machine, sets all the kind of, uh, yeah, sets all the initial variables in state so that it can process and then exec actually execute. So here, if we were to you know, call Rego test.new and pass in a string, um, it would start processing and doing something. Oh, yeah. Data and P are kind of, um, I would say maybe the most important variables you're going to think about that Regal requires you to define and, or use. Um, data is the array of characters. Uh, P is the pointer to the current one that you're processing. Um, so you are going to probably, if you're using Regal, do a lot of uh, looking things up with P and figuring out where you are and keeping track of where you are as you're parsing. So here's a state diagram of that machine. Um, basically, on any vowel, we call the print me action. Uh, on anything else, we just uh, transition to the next state. Since we allow one or more, um, or we require one or more, we start with, we have to have at least one transition moving from the left to the right, and then any more stays in that kind of final state. <coughs> so this is a state machine, which I'm sure you can't read, but um, for the step definition, or for, I'm sorry, not step definition, for a step within a feature. Um, the left side is the keyword given when then and but, and Regal is smart enough to compile that there down and kind of press that down into the simplest machine possible. Um, over on the right, we are basically grabbing everything up until we find a new line, um, capturing that data, and sending it off to uh, something else. This is the state machine for Gherkin proper. Um, I'd like to invite all of you to come up here by the screen. Um, we're going to start. All right, so we're going to talk about the parts of speech a little bit. We've got simple machine definitions within Regal. Um, you've got character literals, you've got character classes, ranges. You can use regular expressions, um, and there's a bunch of default built in, <coughs> like Kenny and White, um, which are pretty obvious what they, what they match. Uh, regular expressions are not generally recommended to be used within a, a regular uh, machine just because uh, you're, now you're starting to mix different ways of processing things and it's usually simpler to specify things in terms of smaller, some, uh, simpler submachines. Next we have operators. Um, 
these should all look very familiar to you if you use regular expressions like get zero or more, one or more, um, optional uh, negation. Regal has two kinds of negation, uh, machine negation, which is the first words one, um, and character level negation, which is used if you're only uh, negating a single character. We've, I think, used them interchangeably by mistake within Gherkin and actually not running any problems with that, but don't, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, you also have union, uh, match either the first or the second. Uh, intersection, match anything that applies uh, that meets both requirements on the left and the right. Uh, difference, match anything in the first that doesn't match the second. Uh, concatenation, which is kind of the bread and butter of chaining together smaller machines to end up with something much more complicated. Uh, the dot is optional, that's, that's kind of the default, uh, default assumption when you're combining two different submachines. So now we can look at a little bit of what you can do as you start combining things. Um, these are simplified a little bit because we're handling a little more um, in Gherkin itself, but um, yeah, basically end of line, we're looking, you know, new line or a character turn new line. Tags are uh, ampersands followed by anything that's not an ampersand or space kind of character. Um, step is a keyword followed by space. Tokens. So this is kind of the final line of the Gherkin uh, lexer. Um, here are all the optional things that we can, we can find and detect. We can specify the entire thing using these submachines. But so what? So we can match everything. We've got this you know, decent sized machine that's a pretty complicated state machine, and it can match all of this stuff, and we can say, hey, hey, we, we match the feature, but you know, what are we going to do with it? That, that doesn't buy us a whole lot. Uh, the, the bread and butter of Regal are the actions. They're really what make it powerful and distinguish it from what you might do with regular expression. Uh, an action is yeah, basically a function that Regal knows how to call that will you know, call the target language, code in the target language, uh, among other things, uh, when, a, uh, when a match happens. When you, I'm sorry, when you transition, uh, make a transition within a machine. You can write them in line. Um, generally, you probably want to name them, where you yeah, give them a name and you call the name down below, that it makes it easier to separate the uh, implementation of those actions from the definition of the machine, which if you're targeting multiple languages or plan on targeting C or Java as well, um, you're going to want to do that so you can separate those actions out into a separate file. So there's four main types of actions. You've got an entering action, all transitions, finishing and leaving. Um, entering action. Here we're matching or we're looking for the string pony. Uh, when we call the entering action, or when we specify an entering action, it will be called when you enter the machine, when you first make the first match of that machine. All transition to action is it, called on every transition within the machine. So even though we specify the single string, um, as we think of each of those characters as a uh, transition, uh, you call that you call that action in every single place. Finishing action uh, takes a little bit more complicated an example to show off. Um, we have P-O-N followed by one or more Ys. Uh, the finishing action will be called when, as you enter the last state of the machine, um, and it will be called every time you enter the last state of the machine. Uh, and that can, that can trip you up a little bit because, uh, for instance, we have one or more Ys here. If we match it even a single one, Regal could consider that being done. Um, if we have more, then we'll keep, we'll keep cycling through that state. And, uh, perfectly acceptable, and that's where we're going to end up. Uh, finally, the leaving action gets called as you exit the machine, um, which would either be the end of the file or uh, potentially some other machine or some other string that you're matching after that. So one of the most difficult things when you are um, building all the stuff up with Regal to match you know, your pattern or your, your language um, is preventing non-determinism. Um, they get complicated fairly quickly. Um, as you can see with the, uh, the full Kirk and state machine, it becomes a little hard to analyze as they get really, really big. Um, you have machines that may, uh, not by intent, but may overlap and you may start matching things in two different machines in parallel at the same time and start seeing all sorts of behavior they're not expecting. So Regal provides some shortcuts for uh, helping prevent that and control that. So here's an example of uh, behavior you may not expect. Let's match anything and then the string no. Same machine for here is actually, uh, I developed a 
fairly complicated for what looks like a simple set of rules. It may not do, or maybe it's doing what you expect, maybe not. Um, we're matching anything. Uh, we're matching the N and then the O character, but then we can, we're still in the any machine because any is greedier um, than what follows it. So even after matching the N and the O, anything else is still consumed by the any machine. Um, so we can add guards. The finish guard is, uh, or the, the finish guard, which basically says, um, as we start matching the second machine, if we complete it, then we leave the first one. So we use this a lot to um, uh, with Gherkin because uh, the scenario descriptions and feature descriptions uh, are very, very fluid. You can write pretty much whatever you want in there. And so this was a good way to uh, start capturing the text that people wrote as their descriptions and terminate when we found one of the you know few keywords that actually meant that we have gone on to the next uh, part of the part of the uh, scenario. Uh, there's also entry guarded, which will terminate the first one as soon as you meet the first character of the second one. Um, and several other ones. Left guarded favors the machine on the left. Longest match is favors the longest match. Um, you can also name priorities and actually specify with integers uh, what you want to have for, uh, precedence. Um, I feel like when if you start having to do that, you may be juggling too many things within one machine, and it might be a better idea to break it up with something simpler. All right, so now we can kind of look at the combination of all of all of those elements into something that we do within Gherkin, uh, which is matching a tag. Um, so if you look at the bottom row first, uh, we're defining this machine for tag as an ampersand followed by anything that's not an ampersand, one or more of those. Um, as soon as we find something that's not an ampersand, we call that begin con content of the entry transition, which uh, basically keeps track of where we are in the stream of uh, data, and also a line number that we're tracking new line somewhere else. Um, and when we finish matching that one or more, we uh, when we leave that, we uh, call sort tag content, which just packs up the data into a string again and sends it off to a listener. Uh, so this is the total machine for Gherkin. It's, uh, I don't know, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's readable not for you right now, but um, I think it's, it's fairly straightforward when you get into it line by line, it was able to be broken up into some pretty simple things. Um, coming from treetop, um, which was about 150 times slower than this, uh, uh, I, some of my first contributions to the Cucumber Project were working on, uh, working on changing some things in treetop, and um, I had a really hard time with it. I, uh, I think there were a lot of, it was a lot harder to reason about what was going on than with Rachel. I think that's one of the one of the big advantages of it, on top of an enormous speed improvement. Okay. This this is the natural break anyway for us to hand off the uh, baton, as it were. Anyway, um, what what Doug uh, was mentioning about uh, uh, the speed of treetop uh, and about the size of that, like that that is, I mean, it's it's clear honestly because we've been using it a lot. Um, but I can understand saying that and thinking like, oh my god, this is the largest regular expression I've ever seen in my life. I'm never using this, right? Well. That, I mean, you could be forgiven for, forgiven for thinking that, except one of the sweet spots of Regal is that that defines the machine, right? Well, Regal can output machines for Ruby, uh, C, C++, C Sharp, or not, uh, yeah, C Sharp, Java, D, all of the D ones kind of messed up. Um, uh, re, uh, Go now, and then someone's also working on JavaScript. So one of the sweet spots of Regal is writing these finite state machines, these parsers, and then implementing all the actions in your host language. In Gherkin right now, we have a parser in Ruby, in C, and in Java. Um, and that has been a huge boon. That's one of the deciding factors of Regal. So if you're looking at Polyglot, or you're going to be deploying this thing, you want to deploy it in a lot of different environments, I would definitely give Regal uh, a look-see. But uh, so moving on, um, we've got, so, that's a lot to take in, like all this stuff. Like it's it's regular regular expressions are weird enough to begin with, and now we've just thrown tons of syntax at you. Um, and this part is about how we develop something that was easy to use, easy to test, and that we can improve incrementally. And that was a and this was a big win for us. And so this is how to do BDD or TDD or software development or whatever with Regal. And now the name of the game here is to externalize evidence of operation and then make assertions on that collected evidence. That's basically how you, that's like TD in a nutshell, 
right? Now, whether the, the evidence of the operations shows that it's working properly or it's working improperly, that's unimportant at this point. What you want is to be able to collect data about how the code you are writing is behaving. So we're going to start way back in the dawns of time. This is uh, ASLAC, ASLAC's first commit message that can need a test, pretty much. It says, uh, some basis up and running, still no idea what I'm doing with Regal. And this is the table. He's working in table processing. And you can see here just like the skeleton of stuff. You've got this basic machine. You can see that there's a, a cell is composed of you know, alphanumeric characters. It's a character class, obviously. And when it runs into one of those, it's retrieving information from, uh, from the data, which is the input, and then just puts it to the screen. And then we've got some tests right here. So describe table. You know, it, 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 there's, you know, these are normal tables. Uh, the kind that you would see in Gherkin. Um, and then for each of those, we say, like, okay, we're going to make a new table, we're going to parse it, and we're going to hope that it looks like what we expected. So we're going we're to tokenize it this way. Um, and after a while of doing that, we realized that there was a, uh, there's a problem doing that, because these assertions became bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you go back over here, I mean, we're looping over stuff. And then in every single one, we're creating a, a, a new table object, a new, a new lexers, uh, essentially. Um, and we have no way to see into that. It's just basically saying, like, OK, well, uh, we're just going to have the table return a string. Well, that there are return of a raw data structure. Well, you know, that's OK, except it's difficult to get into the internals. So what we implemented is this scan method. And you can see creating a mock object right here. And so we have now we have these helpers. So it should parse one by two table with a new line. So you call scan, you pass in the literal string, that segment of Gherkin, and then you assert that it's going to output an array with containing one or two. So you're tokenizing it properly. And this leads us eventually to uh, a discussion about what the tests told us. That was a big win. It made things uh, a lot more flexible. So we're saying, okay, well, we're going to use this listener setup everywhere. So we're going to parameterize the Lexer's constructor with a listener. And we're going to use the natural uh, kind of event-based nature of state machines to send a series of events back to the listener as we match things. And so we can then convert those events into a data structure and then make assertions about that data structure. And that's how we're going to test it. So that's just standard dependency injection. So this also allows us to compose listeners for flexibility and additional layers of responsibility. And finally, we can test using a test spy listener, which is a, a sex key recorder. And we'll give you an example right here of what you can do with this and what it looks like and how simple it is. So this is, this is let's say this is our lexer, right? We've got some machine definitions here. I can't put it all in there. But basically, you say, OK, well, definitionalize listener. You know, you assign listener to an instance variable. And then when you call scan on it, you pass in some text. And then the actions run. And in those actions, they just send messages to the listener object. Uh, in real operation, we have a lexer, and then we pass in a parser object. And the, and the parser makes sure that the semantic meaning of those events is, is proper. Uh, but for right now, we're just testing the lexer. So what we do, now these are the, an example of the actions. We can compose listeners. Here's a test by listener. This is it, the sex pee recorder. And I know that I, I, these are not actually sex pees, but you know, whatever. Um, we're not. Uh, we're not going for the academic awards here. Um, so what you have here, it's obvious, the use of method missing. It receives events, it adds them onto an array, and then at the end of the event, at the end of the test, we call two sex B and get it out. So let's say we're going to test, we're going to test this feature, or lex this feature. Feature auto cute, scenario motivation, given plain text is boring, then a GUI must be the answer. What does this test look like? Let's say we save that bit of text into a, an instance variable. Make a new instance of the recorder, pass the recorder into a new version of the lexer, and scan the feature. Then when that's done, we say, OK, like the recorder dot two sex B should equal this. And we drove out the behavior of the lexer and of the Regal state machine case by case by case doing this. And it's actually turned out to be a really simple, uh, uh, you know, really simple way, easy to conceptualize the test, easy to make sure it's doing what you expect it to do. Uh, this is a big win. And eventually, you end up in tests like this. This is one from the Gherkin code base right now. 
And you can see we saw that scan helper in there, but it's just basically you pass in a string into scan and then you assert something about the content of the listener. So a piece of cake. Um, now even going past that, once we begin working on the, on the, uh, uh, on the parser above the lexer, um, we can use Cucumber to test stuff. That's hard, this is our dog food, basically. Um, but when you look at the implementation of these steps, the ones that matter here, they're given a American parser, when the following text is parsed, and then there should be no parse errors. The implementation of these steps looks good. Like <coughs> so it's that simple. Uh, if you are using Regal to do this, you can use the exact same setup, and it's remarkably easy to dog food whatever you're developing and to hit things at the, like, the, the large level to test the entire stack and at the unit level of that lexer, which is really where the rubber meets the road. And you just end up with that, just like that. And now, so, so now we get to when Regal, like when you want to use it. Um, and the, the question here is uh, when it's good for, what it's good for. Um, and the, in, in our experience, it's good for the polyglot stuff. Um, the, uh, like that's the sweet spot. Um, polyglot, uh, like I said, all the different languages, uh, it's, it's just, there's, I would hesitate to recommend to use it if you were only using Ruby, um, because you are going to disagree with me. No, no, I was going to say, the, uh, <clears throat> the Ruby implementation of the Gherkin parser, can you guys hear me okay? My uh, the Ruby implementation uh, was about a 10 or 15 time increase over the treetop. Uh, it wasn't until we switched to C where we got another another tenfold increase on top of that. Um, yeah. I mean, the Ruby, the Ruby one itself probably would have been worthwhile. There were people um, who were parsing features and it was taking several minutes just to get through their features before they could even start processing them. And I mean, with Cucumber being thought of as slow, um, or actually slow in some cases, uh, that's, that's the last thing you want is to have to wait several minutes before you even start. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I think we have, I could, honestly, I'd like to see a, a, a comparison of Citrus to uh, the Ruby output of Regal. That'd be very interesting. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, Citrus, uh, do maybe you go to the Citrus talk? Um, is, is Michael Jackson in here? Maybe, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's that's doing things on kind of a higher level. It's uh, more powerful in some ways. It's con you know constructing an ask. We're not doing that. Um, yeah. We don't have to do that here. Um, we're, we're working kind of at a much lower level, and you get you can get you know pretty significant speed increases if you are willing to kind of delve down and uh, deal with the state of things while you're matching them. Yeah, and, and one of the big things to keep in mind here is that one of the reasons Regal is so fast, even when it's outputting Ruby, is because these data machines they're just I mean they're static arrays of of integers of fixed numbers, right? That's really simple memory wise. Like you're not consuming a whole lot, and then it's just basically doing you know you're just doing array subscripting. Um, when you're dealing with something like Citrus or like TrueTop, you are creating like this. Is probably a, this is one of the shortcomings of uh, of peg the parsing expression grammars and like even packet parsers. It, that they're memory hungry, and in Ruby that translates to in some cases slow, and in some cases too slow to be abused. Like that's what we hit this wall with with Gherkin, and so we had to start with the the, the Gherkin parser written TrueTop. So we went to here, and this has been a great success. Um, but the other, I think the other case that we were looking at is when pure reg, pure reg exon become too confusing. Um, that can happen. Uh, I think this is probably not going to be that big of a deal, honestly. Um, but that's just me. Uh, this is more, uh, no, I, I could see it, uh, maybe not. Um, finally, the other one is speed. Um, it's pretty darn fast. Uh, it's very, <coughs> Yeah, I mean, it's very simple, very straightforward. Uh, it's even the code that it produces. The code's a little ugly, so when you look at it, it is here. It's, it's outputting uh, table driven. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> table driven finite state machines. Uh, if you do run it, you can look at the resulting code, and if you spend some time pouring over it, you can see exactly what it's doing. It's very transparent in that sense at a very low level. Um, I mean, I would always say, that also, the other example I would give is that it's fun. Uh, but it's not everyone who's going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to use this. Finite state machine compiler, that's fun. Uh, I understand if that's not everyone's cup of tea, but Ray really is a blast, and it's kind of fun to use it, honestly, to see like, oh wait, maybe regular expressions aren't so horrible. Uh, they're, they're, they're maligned all the time, but uh, I think they might have a bad reputation. Uh, so, given all the time in the world, do you wanna 
talking about this? There's there's a lot more we can cover. So and, and we got left. Hmm? We got left. What do you mean? We have some time left. Um, yeah, scanners are another uh, kind of higher level construct that's available within Regal. Uh, it's generally very good for tokenizing things. Um, it's a basically a way to kind of specify uh, multiple multiple sets of matches and try to find the longest one and take actions on, on certain ones. We uh, tried to use some scanners in parsing Gergen um, and ran into some problems early on. I don't know if it was for some it, it, of the non-determinism we had to kind of handle ourselves yeah. or, or what, what triggered it. Gergen, the format is not really amenable to scanning very well because there's no like opening and closing anything and scanners kind of they work great with that counting parentheses that kind of stuff well yeah I, I know I kind of gloss over a lot of stuff but uh, so yeah there's there, there are higher level tools that we're not able to use uh, state charts um, you saw a couple of them they're very, very easy to produce um, and examine, and they can really, really help you think about what you're doing and making sure that you are processing things the way you think you are, uh, the actions are being called at the right times. Um, we use them quite a bit, um, quite a bit. And so it, it's also very easy to generate a state chart for a submachine within you know, a big complex one, so you can just look at the individual pieces, because obviously looking at the full state chart for a Gergen, um, you're not gonna get very far unless you uh, wanna give yourself a headache. Uh, finally, yeah, multiple machines. Um, if machines are named, you can include one machine in another machine, uh, you can define your actions in one machine and, and, uh, and include the machine defining the behavior, or I'm sorry, defining the uh, patterns in another machine. Um, it's a really useful way to break down the complexity even further, um, or up to us as with doing polyglot. So, uh, anybody have any questions about it? Yes. Yes. Is it called it is or dot charts? Uh, it, well, it that puts dot charts, yeah. Sorry. And does it, can it also export to something like ENF or other? No. No. Or any other format other than like the XML. Uh, it uses XML's intermediate uh, language, so go figure. Okay. Yes. Does the, so does the Gherkin parser take advantage of uh, I can't remember exactly what the term was, but uh, basically the, the functions you can embed in your in the action handlers to like switch switch machines while in a particular right. action. And if so, was that kind of a pain to deal with? That, that, it introduced a lot of complexity in my my use of Gradle, but I didn't know if maybe I was just using it wrong. No, well, um, so I will repeat the question. Uh, one of the things you can do within actions um, is you know, specify kind of go-to methods and jump to other machines and then return from them. So that's really useful if you need to try to do something like uh, parse something with like balanced parentheses, um, or, you know, kind of nested recursive things. You can do that. It's a little trickier. Um, it's not the strongest point for Radle. Um, yeah. Well, uh, let me jump in here. Um, if you look at the source of hprecot, uh, y actually does that to parse HTML. So I, I imagine that he knew this is like a big F you to computer scientists because you're not, you, know, you regular expressions are not a thing that can be used to parse HTML. Like it's, it's not possible to do it. And then, but he takes Regal, which is all about it, and then, uh, and then writes a parser. So yeah, so the question was, did we have difficulty, did we use that or did we have difficulty using that, that, uh, that kind of construct within parsing Gherkin? And, and we, uh, we did, we actually were able to define everything within one machine pretty simply and didn't have to um, use any, you know, exiting machines and returning from machines. Um, it looked complicated and uh, probably, you know, it's one more thing to kind of juggle. Um, the, the name of the action, does anyone want to guess what like the, in, in Regal syntax, what you type to get it to, to jump someplace else? F go to. So if you think regular expressions are confusing, I'll just add go to's into the mix and you know, you'll have fun there. Yes? This isn't really a question, but um, my experience with the radio, one of the best things about it is it you can get a bunch of alternating patterns and we'll try all of them at once. It basically paralyzes it and it's supposed to do some background to the Ruby's regular expressions. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it executes machines in parallel in many cases, which is some woke time. Uh, one reason why you do need priorities when you're you know, getting parallel execution that you're not expecting. Um, 
Yeah, so you, you know, it's executing simultaneous paths and uh, and determining the best, you know, determining the best match, or you know, or you set your own actions to um, capture the state of things when you start ma start down one path and you successfully end one of those paths, and you can grab the you know the proper string and process it or do something else with it. But it's yeah, it's a really really powerful. Thing. Yes. I noticed in one of the examples you gave, you actually embedded the action inside the definition. Yes. Right. Yep. Um, no, no, do you have a further yeah. question? I guess, so Regal will execute the action when it sees it, I guess? Yeah, Regal, Regal will call that action. Um, you don't have to name it. That's kind of like an anonymous action. I don't know. Yeah, it's, well, okay, keep in mind that Regal, it's like a huge preprocessor. So you write like a .rl file, and then you run Regal and you pass it like a .rl, like say, table.rl, and you run you know Regal-r, table.rl, and that means, okay, I'm going to parse this, I'm going to output Ruby. It takes the contents of those yeah, unnamed actions and just plops them right into the code where they would be. It's just like expanding a macro. Um, and it will execute them as soon as it's found, yeah, when you're, when you're matching, I should say. Yeah, generally, if you are going to target multiple languages, you're not going to want to do that because it, it is now coupling the code that's being executed um, with the machine definition you know, the uh, pattern itself. Um, for things like fgoto and freturn, you, you would put them in there because those are actual regal. Uh, regal <coughs> yeah, so one of the things we didn't talk about is that you, you yeah, basically you have like your one machine which contains your, like your common machine definitions, your one regal file. Then you have implementations for all of your target languages. And what we did is we wrote a, 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 a <coughs> set of shared specs and we run those in JRuby and in, in Ruby and all that. And so we can test all of that using basically one set of, of stuff and minimizing duplication. Got uh, one or two more minutes for questions. Anybody else? Yes. Well, okay. Um, you can use different alphabet types, so I believe you could be able to do that. I, I can't remember off the top of my head what if there is like a like a binary alphabet type, um, but you would want you want to look at the uh, uh, manual about that. We I mean, we we glossed over the entire uh, concept of of the alphabet type. Uh, we're I mean, so basically we're doing it one byte at a time, and we're assuming that all input is UTF eight. Um, but yeah, you want we want to look at the, the manual. Well, uh, yeah, just uh, thanks then to uh, everybody who supported us in this and our employers for sending us down here. Uh, I can't hear can you. Oh, sorry. Thank you, everyone, and everyone up there. Oh, we have one more question. Will these slides be available somewhere? Uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, you can see it on my, on my GitHub. And, uh, oh, the, the bottom link is the history of that, of the a uh, quote about, you know, there's a type of programmer who thinks, oh, I'll, I'll use regular expressions and it's, it's an eye-opener. Um, it didn't start with JWZ.